<laughs> oh, yeah. It's after me. It's after me. Oh, my God. It's going to get me. Oh, no. It's got me. Oh. Well, I hope I got your attention. We do welcome you to a special holiday podcast. What holiday? Halloween. Monsters, ghouls, horror stories, and movies. There is a never-ending supply of ghastly gore and horror. It starts very early in life when parents tell fairy tales that are just grisly. A wolf eats Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother. In the original Little Mermaid, the heron instructed, Before the sun rises, you must plunge this knife into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again and form into a fish's tail, and you will once more be a mermaid. Disney twisted most of that, yet it still doesn't end well for the sweet mermaid. Check out our podcast concerning the real stories of fairy tales for some startling revelations. There has been a continuous fascination with the macabre and horror since ancient times, actually. We will explore some infamous monsters, such as Frankenstein, vampires, werewolves, mummies, zombies, etc., and take a look at some of the strange activities of the people who came up with these scary creatures. Yeah. Okay, because of my background, I just can't resist speculating on why we have this fascination. So, before we go any further, though, Dr. Deneen will give us a brief history of Halloween. Thank you. October 31st is All Hallows' Eve, the precursor to All Saints' Day. Like many Christian feasts, it's an adaptation of indigenous customs worldwide. The Catholic Church understood that its followers had become very attached to their own traditions, so it had the good sense to give them new meaning instead of forbidding them. The commemoration of the beginning of winter was declared to be a remembrance of all the blessed souls in heaven on November 1st. November 2nd remembers souls being purified on their way to heaven, still in purgatory. Some have speculated that the idea of ghosts is a token of those being purified, as Hamlet reminds us. The Irish brought the custom of carving vegetables as a pleasurable activity and a reminder, although as a person of Irish descent, in the case of my ancestors, I will remind it was turnips, not pumpkins. Pumpkins became popular in America. The holiday has a, a long history, stretching back to Irish, Spanish, and other worldwide traditions. The famous Day of the Dead, Dias Mortes, celebration in Mexico, involves families doing homage to their departed relatives and friends, picnicking near graves, and dressing up in spectral costumes. See our Holidays Around the World podcast for more details. The history of trick-or-treating traces back to Scotland and Ireland, where the tradition of guising, which is going from house to house at Halloween and putting on a small performance to be rewarded with food or treats, goes back at least as far as the 16th century as does the tradition of people wearing costumes at Halloween. There are many accounts from 19th, 19th century Scotland and Ireland of people going house to house in costume at Halloween, reciting verses in exchange for food and sometimes warning of misfortune if they are not welcomed. I remember Halloween celebrations taking different forms to me as I aged. When I was a young child, trick or treat was a fun thing. As a teen, it was more street parties, soaping store windows, 
you know, like writing things on store windows and soap and playing tricks on some people. Uh, one particular uh, trick that I remember with some fondness, actually, I remember collecting dog poop in a paper bag, which we sprinkled with lighter fluid. And then we went to the American Nazi party house, knocked on the door, lit the bag, and rang doorbell, and then hightailed so we could watch from a safe distance. They would come out the door, and they stomped on the bag, thus getting their shoes dirty. <laughs> I enjoyed celebrating with my children in a more positive sense here, and hand, handing out treats as I grew older. It was kind of fun. The wearing of costumes at Halloween may come from the belief that supernatural beings or the souls of the dead roam the earth at this time. The practice may have originated in a Celtic festival held on the 31st of October to mark the beginning of winter. It was called Salmon in Ireland, Scotland and the Isle of Man, and Calon Geith in Cornwall, Wales, and Brittany. The festival is believed to have pre-Christian roots. After the Christianization of Ireland in the 5th century, some of these customs may have been retained in the Christian observance of All Hallows' Eve in that region, which continued to be called Salon Palanqui, blending the traditions of their ancestors with new Christian ones. It was seen as a limited time when the spirits of fairies, the Exai, and the souls of the dead could more easily come into our world. It was believed that the Osai needed to be propitiated to ensure that the people and their livestock survived the winter. Treating evolved from the custom of making donations for prayers offered to redeem the souls in purgatory. In the United States, Halloween used to be an occasion for nihilism, destruction, and vandalism. In the early 1900s, there were many newspaper accounts of destructive and violent behaviors. Adults were encouraged to offer treats as an incentive for young children to behave themselves and not be hooligans. In some cultures, Treating may have originated from the idea that the souls of the dead who roamed the earth on Halloween needed some kind of treat or help to find their way to the afterlife. Reminiscent of uh, Egyptians, I think. There are various theories about why so many people enjoy horror. It has been noted that even babies enjoy being spooked, for example, in the peekaboo game. Matthias Clausen, director of the Recreational Fear Lab at Aris University in Denmark, in what I consider to be suspect research, posited three broad types of horror fans, adrenaline junkies, white knucklers, and dark copers. White knucklers try to lean out of the experience by trying to find the situation funny or lessening their exposure to the scary stimuli. Now, Dr. Olatunji from Vanderbilt University in Tennessee points out that being scared causes a release of dopamine in the brain. The effect is, sim is, is a similar action to uh, taking cocaine, although in the case of cocaine, uh, use uh, the dopamine receptors are activated rather than releasing major amounts of dopamine. Same same outcome though. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain which acts as a chemical messenger, communicating messages between nerve cells in your brain and the rest of your body. It's kind of it's got a popular name, the feel good hormone. Dopamine is made by your adrenal gland, and the neurotransmitter is known to give you a sense of pleasure. As, as a matter of fact, the human brain is hardwired to find behaviors that release dopamine. The more dopamine released, the better you feel, and you begin to seek more of that feeling. 
Now, there are two outcomes to being scared. One I call resolved scaring, by which I mean the person being scared discovers they are, in fact, not in danger. The other I call unresolved, in which the person discovers the danger is real. Now, in both cases, there is a mediating and modifying factor, and that is what I call the rescuer. Now, in the first instance, where you're scared and you find out that you didn't have anything to be scared of, the attachment to the person is just as real, and you your, your brain attaches dopamine release and that person. For example, if you take somebody to uh, the amusement park and you ride the roller coaster, everybody screams on the roller coaster, right? Or you decide to go on, a, you know, go with somebody and bungee jump off a bridge. Well, it's pretty scary. But when you survive it and you're with the person, that same person, you tend to attach positive things to them because of all the dopamine that's released. It's a very positive thing. And yeah, I remember as an undergraduate, people talking about that, and we kind of tried it. Take somebody on a date, and you go to some scary kind of thing, and gee, it really does work. People get a positive attachment to you, not by being scared per se, but by being rescued. Anyhow, that's a little aside. The same measured control level of fear that leads people to enjoy tales of the frightening, these tales tend to be archetypes, literary representatives of larger ideas. Perhaps the best example is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which has a number of these ideas. This is written in the early 1800s, and a lot of changes are happening at that time. The first major change is the Industrial Revolution, taking its first faltering steps in Western Europe in the first quarter of the 19th century. People are no longer working as families and farms as much. They're working in factories by themselves. There's also a conflict, there always is, but it was particularly heightened in this period, real or perceived between younger people who are more open to newer ideas older who like to preserve the world they've known, science and spirituality, the simplicity of rural life as opposed to technology. These conflicts are in full force. Now, the Frankenstein monster is brought into existence by an electric current which is combined with inanimate flesh. The monster is very intelligent and aware it has no place in the world. Perhaps that's pointing to the struggle Miss Shelley herself felt daring to write under her own name as a woman during an era in which the short-sighted scorned female brain power. The monster is very much aware of his isolation, fears others' terrors of him. If Shakespeare hadn't already used it several centuries earlier, he could have echoed Caliban's remark in The Tempest, you taught me language, and my prophetess I know how to curse. But I think there is a happier lesson to be learned here. Society needs to be more flexible. Science needs to not fear the possibility of new ideas, or even in this situation, new beings. Ms. Shelley's own psychological struggles represented by the loss of her, a number of her children would have broken a lesser spirit. She coped in a very unique and somewhat bizarre way. Having her husband's heart removed, putting it in a box, and maintaining it as a keepsake. We have to remember, folks, this is in a century before large-scale psychological treatment and a century and a half before good medications. Wow. Got to do a little bit of correcting here. Okay, first of all, Shelley, yeah, she lost her mother, her husband, her sibling in a, in a relatively short period of time. Now, her mother died uh, two days after she was born. Not the mother died uh, two days after she was born, but two days after she gave birth to Mary, Mary Shelley. 
Um, anyhow, psychological treatment has been around a long, long time. Now, more humane treatment began with the advent of moral treatment in the 19th century. Now, a um, story about uh, Mary Shelley keeping her husband's heart in a box deserves a little tiny bit of sharpening. What happened? Percy Shelley was fishing. He drowned in a lake. And when he was cremated, one body part, his heart, would not burn. Why? It is probable that his heart had become calcified from tuberculosis, thus making it less likely to burn. Also, guess what? There was blood inside the heart. So, yeah. And this was made possible by the temperature range of crematories at the time. Indeed, she, Mary Shelley did have a whole lot of bad things happen, including the fact that her first child, her first child, died when it was about two days old. Her next two children died as toddlers. Only one child survived her. What a, what a, what a burden. What a burden. She wants to claim that the idea for the Frankenstein novel, which actually came about as a challenge, which she was with a group of other literary greats, um, Lord Byron, Percy himself, etc., making a bet as to who could write a uh, horror novel. Anyhow, she, she once claimed that the idea for the Frankenstein novel came after having a dream that her young infant child was brought back to life by rubbing her in front of the fireplace. Uh, some people have doubted that. I don't know. It's just one thing she said at one point. Although there is no one author that wrote about mummies, the history of mummies is fascinating. Of course... The ancient Egyptian practice of mummifying and entombing mummies with things they might want when they were reanimated in the afterlife, and the curse said to be attached from mummies to prevent uh, tomb robbers from looting, is the original point or is the origin point of, of mummies. Uh, interestingly, the popular view of mummies has undergone extreme changes. The first mummy tales were highly sexualized, typically featured a female mummy who animated and became um, a sexual partner. When the curse thing got some traction on the basis of stories and then uh, when Lon Chaney's movie came out, mummies started being seen as creatures of horror. It appears the screw continues to turn as there seems to be some more romanticized versions of mummies happening currently. As a child that was born premature, I can certainly identify with Mrs. Shelley's loss and gratitude for my own existence. It's unclear exactly when and where the werewolf legend originated. Some scholars believe the werewolf made its debut in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh jilted a potential lover because she had turned her previous mate into a wolf. Werewolves made another early appearance in Greek mythology with the legends of Lycon. According to this legend, Lycon, the son of Pelagus, angered the god Zeus when he served him a meal made from the remains of a sacrificed boy. As punishment, the enraged Zeus turned Lycon and his sons into wolves. Werewolves also emerged in early Nordic folklore. The saga of the Volsungs tells the story of a father and son who discovered wolf pelts that had the power to turn people into wolves for 10 days. The father-son duo donned the pelts, transformed into wolves, and went on a killing rampage in the forest. The rampage, their rampage ended when the father attacked his son, causing a lethal wound. The son only survived because a kind raven gave the father a leaf with magical healing powers. 
Many so-called werewolves from centuries ago were in fact serial killers, and France has had its fair share. In 1521, Frenchman Pierre Bagot and Michel Verdun allegedly swore allegiance to the devil and claimed to have gotten an appointment that turned them into wolves. After confessing to brutally murdering several children, they were both burned to death at the stake. Burning was thought to be one of the few ways to kill a werewolf. Giles Garnet, known as the Werewolf of Dole, was another 16th century Frenchman whose claim to fame was also an ointment with wolf morphing abilities. According to legend, as a wolf, he viciously killed children and ate them. He too was burned at the stake for his monstrous crimes. But the Bergot, Verdun, Grenet had a mental illness, acted under the influence of a hallucinogenic substance, or were cold-blooded killers, remains up for debate. But it likely didn't matter to superstitious Europeans during the 16th century. To them, such hideous crimes could only be committed by a horrific beast such as the werewolf. Peter Stubb, a wealthy 15th century farmer in Bedburg, Germany, may be the most notorious werewolf of them all. According to folklore, he turned into a wolf-like creature at night and devoured many citizens of Bedburg. Peter was eventually blamed for the gruesome killings after being cornered by hunters who claimed they saw him shapeshift from wolf the human form. Yeah, right. He experienced a grisly execution after confessing under torture to savagely killing animals, men, women, and children, and then eating their remains. He also declared that he owned an enchanted belt which gave him the power to transform into a wolf at will. Not surprisingly, this belt was never found. Peter's guilt is controversial since some people believe he wasn't a killer, but the victim of a political witch hunt, or perhaps a werewolf hunt. Either way, the circumstances surrounding his life and death stoked rampant fears at the time that werewolves were on the loose. Some legends maintain werewolves shape-shifted at will due to a curse. Others state they transform with the help of an enchanted sash or a cloak made of wolf pelt. Still others claim people became wolves after being scratched or bitten by a werewolf. In many werewolf stories, a person only turns into a wolf when there's a full moon. And that theory may not be far-fetched. According to a study conducted at Australia's Calvary Mater Newcastle Hospital, a full moon brings out the, quote, beast in many humans. The study found that of the 91 acute violent behavior incidents at the hospital between August of 2008 and July of 2009, 23% happened during a full moon. Patients attacked staff and displayed wolf-like behaviors, such as biting, spitting, and scratching. Although many were under the influence of drugs and alcohol at the time, it is unclear why they became intensely violent when the moon was full. The werewolf phenomenon may have a medical explanation. Take the case of Peter the Wild Boy, for instance. In 1725, he was found wandering naked on all fours through a German forest. Many thought he was a werewolf, or at least raised by the wolves. Peter ate with his hands and could not speak. He was eventually adopted by the courts of King George I and King George II, and lived out his days as their pet in England. Research has shown Peter likely had Pitt Hopkins syndrome, a condition discovered in 1978, which causes a lack of speech, seizures, distinct 
facial features, difficulty breathing, and intellectual challenges. Other medical conditions that may have encouraged werewolf mania throughout history are lycanthropy, a rare psychological condition that causes people to believe they are changing into a wolf or another animal, food poisoning, hypertrichosis, a rare genetic disorder causing ex extensive hair growth, rabies, hallucination probably caused by hallucinogenic herbs. Throughout the centuries, people have used werewolves and other mythic beasts to explain the unexplainable. In modern time, however, most believe werewolves are nothing more than pop culture horror icons made famous thanks to Hollywood's 1941 flick, The Wolfman. Still, werewolves have a cult following. Werewolf sightings are reported each year, and werewolf legends will continue to haunt the dreams of people throughout the world. Ghosts are everywhere, yet nowhere. Cultures all around the world believe in spirits that survive death to dwell in another realm. In fact, ghosts are among the most widely believed of paranormal phenomena. Millions of people are interested in ghosts. And a 2019 poll found that 45% of Americans say that ghosts definitely or probably exist. The idea that the dead remain with us in spirit is ancient and appears in countless stories from the Bible to Macbeth. It even spawned a folklore genre, ghost stories. Belief in ghosts is part of a larger web of related paranormal beliefs including near-death experiences, life after death, and spirit communication. Such beliefs offer many people comfort. Who doesn't want to believe that our departed loved ones are looking out for us or with us in times of need? Many people have tried or claimed to communicate with spirits over the centuries. In Victorian England, for example, it was fashionable for upper crust ladies to hold seances in their parlors after tea with friends. So-called ghost clubs dedicated to searching for ghostly evidence formed at prestigious universities, including Cambridge and Oxford. And in 1882, the most prominent organization was the Society for Psychical Research. Eleanor Sidgwick was an investigator and later president of that group and could be considered the world's first female ghostbuster. <laughs> Meanwhile, across the pond in the late 1800s, many American psychics claimed to speak to the dead. Most of them were exposed as frauds by skeptical investigators such as Harry Price and Harry Houdini. Despite these early sporadic spirit investigation attempts, it wasn't until recently that ghost hunting became a widespread interest around the world. Much of this is due to the popular TV series Ghost Hunters, which ended 13 seasons without finding good evidence for ghosts. The show spawned dozens of spinoffs and imitators, and it is not hard to see why the show was so popular. The premise is that anyone can look for ghosts. The two original stars were ordinary guys, plumbers in fact, who decided to look for evidence of spirits. Their message? You don't have to be an egghead scientist or even have any training in science or investigation to look for ghosts. All you need is some free time, a dark place, and a few cameras and gadgets. If you look long enough and your evidence of uh, threshold of evidence is low enough, any unexplained light or noise could be evidence of ghosts. Scientifically evaluating ghosts is problematic for several reasons, including that surprisingly diverse phenomena 
are attributed to ghosts to one person, a door closing on its own is a sign of a ghost, while for others, it may be missing keys, a faint scent, a cold area in a home, or even a dream about a dead friend. When sociologists Dennis and Michelle Waskell interviewed ghost experiencers for their 2016 book, Ghostly Encounters, The Hauntings of Everyday Life, Temple University Press, they found that many participants were not sure that they had encountered a ghost and remained uncertain that such phenomena were even possible, simply because they did not see something that approximated the conventional image of a ghost. Instead, many respondents were simply convinced that they had experienced something uncanny, something inexplicable, extraordinary, mysterious, or eerie. Because of this, many people claiming to have had a ghostly experience didn't necessarily see anything that most people would recognize as a classic ghost. In fact, they may have had totally different experiences whose only common factor is that it was not easily explained. Ghost research is greatly complicated by the fact that there's no consensus about what a ghost is, even among the ghost hunters and experts. Some believe, for example, that ghosts are spirits of the dead who get lost on their way to the other side. Others are sure that ghosts are instead telepathic entities projected into the world or strong emotions somehow recorded and later, quote, replayed in the environment, often called a stone tape theory. Still, others create their own categories for different types of ghosts, such as poltergeists, residual hauntings, intelligent spirits, and shadow people. It's a fun exercise in fantasy, but of course, it's all made up, like speculating on different types of dragons. There are as many types of ghosts as you want there to be. There are many contradictions inherent in ideas about ghosts. For example, are ghosts material or not? Either they can move through walls and so solid objects without disturbing them, or they can slam doors shut and throw objects around the room. According to logic, not to mention the laws of physics, it's got to be one or the other. If ghosts are human, human souls, why do they appear clothed and with inanimate objects such as hats and dresses? Not to mention the many reports of ghost trains, cars, and carriages. If instead, ghosts are the result of unavenged deaths, why? Are there unsolved murders? Since, since ghosts are said to communicate with psychic mediums and should be able to identify their killers or the police and so on, just about any claim about ghosts raises logical reasons to doubt it. Ghost hunters use many creative and dubious methods to detect ghostly presences, including psychics. Most ghost hunters claim to be scientific and give that appearance because they use high-tech scientific equipment such as Geiger counters, electromagnetic field detectors, and infrared cameras. Yet none of the, these experiments have ever been shown to actually detect ghosts. The equipment I mean, it, it wasn't designed to do that. People thinking that it does, but it's never been shown to have anything to do with ghosts. But anyhow, centuries ago, people believed that flames turned blue in the presence of ghosts. Now, today, few people believe that little bit of ghost lore, but it's likely that many of the signs taken as evidence by modern ghost hunters will be seen as just as silly and quaint centuries from now. Many ghost hunters claim that ghosts haven't been proven real because we don't yet have the right technology to detect the spirit world. But this, too, can't be true. Either ghosts exist, 
and appear in our ordinary physical world and physical, visible spectrum and therefore can be detected and recorded in photographs, film, and video, or they don't. If ghosts exist and can be scientifically detected or recorded, then we should find hard, hard evidence of it. Yet we haven't. If ghosts exist but cannot be scientifically recorded, then that means that all the photos, videos, audio, and other recordings claimed to be ghosts are not in fact ghosts. With so many contradictions and so little science brought to bear, it's not surprising that despite the efforts of thousands of ghost hunters for decades, no hard evidence of ghosts has been found. Much of the belief in ghosts comes not only from television shows, but some personal experience. Maybe the person grew up in a home the presence of a spirit was taken for granted. Maybe they had some unnerving experience on a ghost tour or at a local haunt. But still, they believe science has offered a logical, physical rationale for ghosts. <laughs> there have been people who claim that Albert Einstein himself proved the possibility of ghosts with his first law of thermodynamics, i.e., if energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only change form, then what happens to our body's energy when we die? Could that somehow reappear as a ghost? The idea seems superficially reasonable unless you understand basic physics. The answer is simple and not at all mysterious. After a person dies, the body's energy goes where all organisms energy goes after death into the environment. The energy is released in the form of heat and the body is transferred into the animals that eat us, wild animals if we are unburied or worms if we are interred or heat if we're cremated. And the plants that absorb us, they absorb the, the nutrients too. So there's no bodily energy that survives death. When legions of amateur ghost hunters imagine and portray themselves as on the cutting edge of ghost research, they are engaging in what folklorists call ostension or legend tripping in the form of play acting in which people act out an existing narrative or legend, often involving ghosts or supernatural elements. In his book, Aliens, Ghosts, and Cults, Legends We Live, uh, University Press of Mississippi. Folklorist Bill Ellis notes that ghost hunters take the search seriously and venture out to challenge supernatural beings, confront them in consciously dr dramatized form, then return to safety. The stated purpose of such activity is not entertainment, but a sincere effort to test and define boundaries of the real world. It's a fun and fascinating hobby, but Come on, it isn't investigation or research. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what all the scientists, skeptics, and ghost hunters think. If ghosts are real and are some sort of as yet unknown energy, then their existence will, like all other scientific findings, sooner or later be discovered and verified by scientists through controlled ex experiments, not by weekend ghost hunters wandering around abandoned houses late at night with cameras, flashlights, Geiger counters, da-da-da-da-da. Despite mountains of ambiguous photos, sounds, and videos, the evidence for ghosts is no better today than it was a year ago, a decade ago, or a century ago. There are two possible reasons for the failure of ghost hunters to find good evidence of their quarry. The first is that ghosts don't exist and that psychology, misperceptions, mistakes, and hoaxes can explain reports of ghosts. Second option is that ghosts do exist, but the ghost hunters are simply incompetent and need to bring more scientific rigor to the search because what they've done so far has clearly failed. Ghost hunting is not really about the evidence. If it was, the search would have been abandoned long ago. Instead, it's about having fun with friends, telling spooky stories in the enjoyment of pretending they're searching the edge of the unknown. After all, everyone loves a good ghost story. That's quite true.
The idea of vampires is worldwide, says Jonathan Weiss, folklorist, historian, and founder of Jonathan Weiss Tours in New Orleans, TellsToday.com. It's estimated that well over 98% of all the cultures that exist or ever have existed have vampire legends within them. But why? Are vampires real? Depending on your definition, it just might be. If you strip down the folklore and just come up with a standard set of facts, vampires very well could be real, Weiss says. It said, there certainly are people who consider themselves vampires, and yes, they drink blood. To better understand, you'll need a few facts, including the history behind these compelling creatures. The idea of vampire-like Creatures feasting on human blood has been around for thousands of years and first gained a foothold in Eastern Europe, according to Joseph Laycock, professor of religious studies at Texas State University. And while vampire folklore isn't really known, the word vampire is, according to Laycock. The first instance that we have of this word vampire in English is actually from the 1700s and is describing merchants engaged in price gouging. Laycock tells today.com. I've often heard the term blood sucking from high interest on loans, for example. In 1819, vampires became more mainstream when John Wilson Poldori wrote The Vampire, a fictional story taken from the story of Lord Byron. It's the first of his kind to make vampires seem aristocratic and even seductive, not unlike Byron himself. Nearly 80 years later, Bram Stoker published the now iconic book Dracula, based on Vlad the Impaler, the real-life Romanian prince with a thirst for bloody warfare. Stoker's Count Dracula is a far cry from Byron's sexy, womanizing vampire. Quote, he has hairy palms, he has bad breath, and he he's more like a corpse, Laycock says. Check out one of our earliest podcasts on Vlad the Impaler for a lot more details. Bella Lugosi's Dracula essentially set the bar for all other vampire movies. The black and white movie established Dracula as a wealthy debonair vampire whose immortal kiss is desirable instead of deadly. For the most part, it's how many people perceive vampires even today. Since then, there have been plenty of vampires in books, movies, and television shows to feed our appetite. Bram Stoker's Count Dracula remains the most enduring, and in 1992, the book was made into a film starring Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, and Keanu Reeves. And Rice's novel, Interview with a Vampire, was turned into a big screen feature in 1994 and caused quite the stir after Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt were cast as beloved vampire characters Louis and Lestat. Along with the serious and scary vampire portrayals, we've also seen a lot of funny takes on these blood-sucking creatures. There's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a 1992 film about a teenage vampire hunter, as well as the 2014 mockumentary, What Will Do in the Shadows which chronicles the lives of vampire roommates and their mundane battles over whose turn it is to take out the garbage. In 2019, the movie was turned into a TV series with the same name. You didn't think we'd forget about Twilight, did you? The best-selling Stephanie Meyer series about a high schooler who falls in love with a vampire went on to sell hundreds of millions of copies. In 2008, 
the first of five blockbuster movies based on the book series was released, leading to a whole new generation of vampire, or, or at least Edward Cullen fans. So are vampires real? If you consider people who drink the blood of others for pleasure, the answer is yes. A 2015 survey conducted by the Atlanta Vampire Alliance have found there are at least 5,000 people in the United States who identify as real vampires. Known as sanguines, they are people who have blood fetish and participate in various blood-related activities. All others simply identify themselves as vampires and, like the fictional creatures, avoid sunlight and drink human blood from donors. There are also psychic vampires that feed in a completely different way. They steal the energy off the living, Weiss says. Some people just don't create energy that people normally make for themselves. As a result, they take it from other people to feel complete. Blood-sucking vampires can be found on six of the seven continents, according to Weiss. It seems a worldwide thing. There are different forms, different cultures, and different countries. While it's hard to know exactly where vampires live, nearly everyone agrees that New Orleans is a good place to start. The idea of vampires in New Orleans is a very, very old concept, Weiss explains. Believed to, be, to have been built on cursed ground, New Orleans has long been known as a city steeped in mysticism, voodoo, and the occult. New Orleans is also the backdrop of Anne Rice's best-selling book, Interview with the Vampire. A novel, Laycock says it's had a huge influence on vampire subculture after its release in 1976. But does that make New Orleans a vampire haven? Do the undead walk the streets at night hunting victims in the Big Easy? Something people don't realize is exactly how many strange disappearances New Orleans has had in the, just the past few decades, Weiss says. Does he attribute them to the occult Oh, God, yes, he says. There's always been a huge occult influence in New Orleans. It's just always been accepted. Whether these disappearances have anything to do with vampires is up for debate. But according to Weiss, strange things, things we really don't want to know about, happen all the time. Stay tuned, folks. Any wonderful topics on this podcast are coming up. Please take the time to join us and give us your comments and likes. Indeed. Thank you for joining us and check back with us. We'll have more coming up. Bye for now.